Hey, welcome back to our study. This is part three of our study called Arise and Go. Looking at Genesis chapter 31, 1 through 21. And today we are focusing in on 4 through 16. And this study is called Jacob's Case for Moving. Okay, because God's told him to go. He says, arise and go. He needs to go. Now he needs to go talk to his wives because they're going with him. And so he brings this argument to his wives. So he's prepared to leave Laban's house. He goes to Rachel and Leah, explains to them, okay, we got to pack up everything and we're leaving and here's why we're doing it. And it's never an easy task for a husband to ask their wives to, to leave, ask their wives, hopefully it's only one wife, right? Ask their wife to leave the comfortableness of their home, to follow him to a place that they do not know. Now Jacob has to convince two women, which is not an envious task. But for a normal guy, a God-fearing man who should only have one wife, Jacob, um, you know, it is a difficult thing to do. So Jacob shows love and honor to his wives by presenting a case as to why they should move. He doesn't just say, hey, women, pack up, let's go. He doesn't tell them why. You know, he sits, takes them and sits them down and talks to them. So first he sends to his wives that they meet him out in the field where they can talk in private. Then Jacob begins telling them his six points as to why they should move. He has a six-point argument. <laughs> so he's thought this out, okay? He's, he's, he's thinking these things through. And here's, here's his arguments. Point number one, your father is against me, but God is for me. He points out the fact, which was probably obvious to them, that their father was no longer on Jacob's side. Yet even though Laban had turned against him, God had not. The God of his father was with him. So that's point number one. You know, Laban, your dad has turned against me, but God is for me, as you can tell. It's obvious, right? You've seen these things. You know these things. Point number two, I served your father well. Jacob reminds his wives that he had served their father with all his strength, but their father cheated him and changed his wages ten times. Rachel and Leah know the inconsistency and cheating ways of their father all too well. So this is an obvious point to them too. Like, yeah, we've seen this. We know what's going on. We know our dad. He's not a good guy. He's always cheating. Point number two, well taken. Point number three, God kept me safe. Even though Laban had acted this way, God did not permit Laban to harm him. Jacob points to the fact that God often restrains the evil that worldly, that worldly people would do against God's children. God was in control, and Laban could only act with the permission of God. This is a great point. He's saying, you know, <clears throat> God is with me. You know, he's protected me. He's kept me safe from your father. Your father could have harmed me, but God stopped him from doing it. God did not allow him, did not give him permission to do that. So that's a great point. You know, it's okay to leave because God is, <laughs> is on our side. And um, that's, always, that's always a good point. Now, point number four, Jacob says, I prospered despite your father's efforts. Every time that Laban changed his agreement with Jacob, then how he prospered matched it. His striped sheep were what Laban said he would be, or he would get, then Jacob's striped sheep would multiply and be strong. If Laban then switched and said, well, you only get the speckled ones now, then the speckled ones would be multiplying and be strong. And Laban couldn't get ahead. Every time he saw that what he said was what Jacob's, you know, his wage increased, every time he changed it, then God would change which animals would multiply. And the question is why? Well, God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. It was God's doing, he says. If you remember the, the story just before this, Jacob was cutting and stripping sticks. And he was trying to manipulate, you know, which animals were uh, stronger, which ones would have children. Now he admits that God is the one that has brought prosperity. And it wasn't because of his magical sticks. He doesn't mention the sticks. Well, he doesn't say, remember when I was out there putting all those sticks and I got the, I got the right animals to breed and all that kind of stuff. Remember that? <clears throat> he, doesn't, he doesn't attribute it to himself at all. He just says, yeah, it was God. God did that. So that was a good point. That is the correct point. Uh, he's got the right theology now. It was God who was doing it. Even though he might have put those sticks out there, he realizes, plus the dream that he had, 
that it wasn't him. It was God's doing all along. Point number five, God showed me it was him. Jacob can say for a fact that he was not the cause of the prosperity because Jacob had a dream. And in the dream, God showed him what was going on. It was God's providential care for Jacob. I have seen all that Laban is doing to you, God says. God was well aware of Jacob's situation. We must remember this too. If we are getting cheated or mistreated in some way, remember that God is watching. He's keeping a record of all the wrongs that are done against you. He will repay the evildoers. God is your kinsman redeemer. He will avenge the wrong that has been done to you. So these are all lessons that we've learned throughout Genesis. God is in control. God, through his providence, takes care of his children. Evildoers can't get away with what they're doing. God is keeping all record of wrongs. And God will avenge his people. They'll do it. And uh, we don't have to avenge ourselves. We don't have to take revenge. God will avenge his people because he is the kinsman redeemer. He is the kinsman. And he will take care of you. All right, point number six. I made a vow to God I must fulfill. <laughs> Here you go. That, there you go. That, that's a good reason. I made a vow. I got to fulfill this vow. <clears throat> Remember, we read this before. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now rise and go. That's what God says to him. Remember back in Bethel when you anointed that pillar and you made a vow? Now it's time to fulfill that vow. God points Jacob back to the latter dream in Bethel. Remember what Jacob said there. In Genesis 28, 20, he says, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. God is saying to Jacob that he kept him. He gave him food to eat, gave him clothes. Actually, he's made him very rich. And now it's time to return to your father's house. <clears throat> God's saying, I've kept this part of my vow. Now you have to do your part and go back to your father's house. And I'm still protecting you, but you have to go. So the question is, will Jacob return home and see if God will allow him to get there in peace? That's the question that God has given to him now. Now the ball's in your court. <laughs> he says, I kept my end of the bargain. You said if I kept you and did all this and, and uh, give you all the things you asked for, <clears throat> Then, you know, if I return to my father's house in peace, then you will be my God. Well, now is the time to return back to your father and see if I don't keep you in peace. So, he has to go. So that's the six points. Now we get to Rachel and Leah's response. So now that Jacob has explained why he thinks they should go, he waits for their response. I wonder what answer he was expecting to get. What he does get is Rachel and Leah complaining about their father. And they have several points of their own. Point number one is, our father has excluded us from the inheritance. Laban's plans for the future do not include his daughters. Maybe he was successfully, since he successfully married them off, he turned to just focusing on his sons, which would fit with what we already know and what he's already done. And, you know, he's, he's already given a bunch of sheep and goats to his sons. But at any rate, Rachel and Leah feel as if their father has already cut them out of his future. There's no future with him, with them, with their father. <clears throat> so they feel that their father is already done with them. Point number two, our father treats us like foreigners. Laban's treatment of his daughters has caused such a large rift that they feel completely alienated from their family. They are now strangers to the rest of the household. They, they feel like they're not even part of the family anymore. They've been kicked out. They're like strangers, foreigners. They're not part of the family. That's a horrible feeling. So that's how they feel. <clears throat> this is what their dad has done to them. Point number three, our father treated us as goods to be sold. This undoubtedly is their way of venting their frustration of how Laban treated them 14 years ago. Jacob had no money when he came and asked for Rachel, and so he worked for seven years for the dowry, which belonged to first Leah and, and then... The second seven years belong to Rachel. Would they see any of this dowry? Would they see any of this seven years of work themselves? Would the 14 years of hard labor Jacob worked come to them? No. Laban traded Rachel, treated Rachel and Leah as items to be sold, like chattel. 
everything that God has taken away from their father actually belonged to them and their children. That's what they're saying. You know, everything that Jacob worked for, all those years that he put in, actually belongs to Rachel and Leah and their children. But Laban spent it away. So God just took away what didn't belong to them, belonged to Laban in the first place. That's their, that's their point. It's like, well, you know, our father spent everything that was ours. So he doesn't have a plan for our future. He treats us like we're foreigners in the house. And, you know, he's taken everything that's ours, rightfully. So their conclusion, whatever God has told you to do, do. They are in complete agreement with Jacob and with God on this matter. Not only do they, do they agree with Jacob, but they add their mistreatment to Jacob's list of reasons to go. You know, they're saying, yes, all your points are valid, but here's some more points to add on why we need to go, because they've mistreated, he's mistreated us. After all the envy and the baby battles that have been going on between Rachel and Leah, you know, these two women finally agree on something. <laughs> Jacob, you're right, we need to leave. This is clearly the hand of God working here. He's reconciled these two women over the point that they need to go and they need to leave. It's very interesting how this this comes together for Jacob. Like Jacob must have been like, Phew, yes, that worked out. Good, good. So <clears throat> now he's ready to go. He's got the answer from his wives. His wives are in full agreement with him. Yes, let's go. Our dad is horrible. And so now they're getting ready to go. So next time we'll look at verses 17 through 21. And uh, we'll see how Jacob finally gets away from Laban. Kind of. But he does.